It's often said that it will not have any influence on, on medicines and medicines uh, prices. And we've heard that argument before in many other trade agreements that either the uh, EU is negotiating with, for instance, India or Thailand or other countries. Uh, same on, on uh, trade agreements that the US is negotiating, like the TTPA. Um, but I think we, we, there, there is evidence already from previous uh, trade agreements that actually show what the impact is on prices of medicines and, and, and access. And I wanted to, to know whether any of the panelists can, can share some of that evidence uh, of what we have learned from the past uh, to show that this is actually a real risk that has been documented and to counter some of the arguments that it won't actually have any influence. Thank you, I'll take, I'll take a couple of comments and then I'll ask the panelists to, uh, to respond to them. And if you could introduce yourself also, Joel. Oh, Joel Action, Health Action International. So just in response to what Els was saying, um, with regard to if CETA goes through this a comprehensive economic trade agreement between the EU and Canada, um, which is still being finalized, um, but if it goes through, we've just, a colleague and I have just published a paper which says that it will probably, because of the um, patent term exclusivity, it's going to add two years to Canadian patents, or up to two years, it'll probably increase Canadian price spending by about 5%. So currently we spend about $25 billion a year Canadian on um, prescription drugs, and it'll probably add about a billion um, when, the, when it becomes fully um, implemented. Thank you, Joel. And I think that's the kind of information that could perhaps also circulate. That sounds like very useful. I saw the point. Yes, good morning. I'm uh, Larry Bassan from PERC, uh, the European Consumer Organization. I have a question for our U.S. colleagues, and also one for David, on the lobbying issue, on the positioning of different organizations and the imbalance in terms of uh, interest representation vis-à-vis -vis the TTIP uh, negotiations. Uh, I wanted to ask U.S. colleagues what is the position of patients' organization here in the United States uh, in relation to TTIP. In Europe, we see that uh, they, they don't take any position, they're very silent, and they've been silent throughout the debate on clinical trials and also uh, in relation to the new European Medicine Agency policy. Uh, so we were very surprised, and uh, maybe not so surprised because they're all funded by the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, but I wanted to see whether the situation is uh, similar in the United States. And I wanted to ask David about uh, pharmaceutical companies pressuring consumer organizations uh, to change position on TDP. What do you mean? Thank you. Thank you for those questions. Any other uh, comments? Are, is there any, are there any American participants here who would like to use this opportunity to convey message to their representatives because that's <coughs> where, after all, we're in the Capitol building. So this may be uh, a good opportunity to get through to your representatives. Jamie? I guess. I mean, I, I, I'll, I'll go after anyone else, but I mean, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm putting the queue, that's all. And in, okay. in, while Jamie talks, anyone else who wants to make a comment? <laughs> and, and, uh, uh, raise your hand so I, I put you on the list. Go ahead. Okay, sorry. Okay. Well, um, uh, the, the New York Times had an editorial a couple of days ago, uh, uh, yesterday I think, on uh, complaining about the fact that pharmaceutical benefit manufacturers are creating restricted formularies for insurance. And uh, there's all this move to the higher tiers on the on the drug prices. You have um, you have um, and you you, know, you described this in your in your talk about um, I know that AIDS patients were paying fifty dollars for a copay for a drug per month are now paying being asked to pay five or six hundred dollars a month for a copay on expensive AIDS drugs. Uh, so you know the good thing is there's this expanded insurance through Obamacare and through pharma, uh, through Medicaid. The bad part is the response to the lack of any restraint on the prices, uh, uh, the fact that Medicare will pay for anything no matter what the price is, it, it, it encourages and incentivizes people to be extremely aggressive in the United States on the prices, and that has an effect throughout the world as well. 
So uh, I think what was unfortunate about the New York Times editorial is they didn't discuss any remedies other than rationing. I mean, basically, the rat, the current idea is that if you don't like a high price, you don't pay for it. And, um, or you have a higher, the reason they have a higher co-pay is so that the patient doesn't take it and doesn't take advantage of the program. I mean, that's the reason for reinsuring, asking a 20 or 30% co-pay on a cancer drug is not, it's not to save the 20 or 30%, it's to save the whole thing. So that, because the patient won't even get the drug in the first place. That's, that's where the big saving come from. So we're really entering a, a, a period where uh, in the United States is joining, I think, the rest of the world in that respect, where, where rationing has become, will become the order of the day unless there's an alternative. And I think the New York Times shouldn't address it. Uh, we think the alternative is, is full delinkage of R&D costs and drug prices so that you you just make drugs generics all the time, very cheap prices. You have a separate way of rewarding people that are good at developing drugs. That's a part of the healthcare budget. It's built into the system. It becomes part of trade agreements to make sure that that cost is distributed throughout the world in some fair way. But that the but the patient when they're sick isn't asked to pay fifteen hundred dollars a week for a cancer drug or three thousand dollars a week for some of the new ones or five thousand dollars a week for for a drug to keep them alive or you know thirty thousand dollars a year if you have the rest of your life for for, for an AIDS drug or something like that. So I think that or a thousand dollars a pill for the uh, hep C drug. I think that uh, uh, when people talk about the high prices and the rationing problems and they don't sort of consider the alternatives, they're not really improving their situation that much. I think the companies and some of the trade press lately, what they've said is, they said, uh, like about the hep C drug, what they said in this one article is they said, uh, uh, people said, well, there's been a lot of outcry about the, you know, the $84,000 hep C treatment. And uh, is, is Gilead in trouble? And, and the answer was no, because it's all of this just talk, just verbal stuff, but nobody was proposing solutions. So the solutions really are going to involve IPR. You're going to have to change the way you think about IPR. You're going to have to go against the idea that you grant the monopoly and then you bargain for the life of somebody with somebody that can say no, and, you know, because and, 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 you're, you're not going to be a great bargainer under those circumstances. You have to, you have to change the nature of the, of the negotiation. So the, the risk with this negotiation is going to make it harder to fix things, going to make it harder to reform things. Not only, as, as David and other people have mentioned, are they not building in the kind of good things you could imagine in a socially responsible trade agreement, the things that would be kind of solving problems in a, you know, in a different way, but you're going to make it harder uh, for the governments outside of the trade agreements to fix things. The other thing is there's like nothing in there on the IP chapter on the medicine that needs to be in a trade agreement. I mean, I mean, EU has patents, the US has patents, the EU has data exclusivity, we have data exclusivity. Why put all those things, why write them into a trade agreement? If there's going to be a rollback, it's because there's a good reason for a rollback. It's because prices are too high and people want lower prices. And the point of putting the trade agreement is so that we can't easily roll back prices and things, and so or control prices or reform the way we do anything. So this is, uh, uh, I think that in lobbying the members of the Congress, I think the transparency thing is key. But the other thing is like trying to explain why, why, uh, uh, why they can't imagine a different path on the future of drugs. I mean, everybody else, except for the trade negotiators and the, the members of Congress that monitor these things, seems to recognize things are going crazy in terms of drug prices. Why, why don't they get it? Thank you, Jane. And I believe there's one more question. Hello. Hello, I'm Leonardo from the European Public Health Alliance. I had a couple questions. Um, yesterday, it, it was clear from the um, U.S. lead negotiator that one of, in his views, one of the benefits for consumers is actually speeding up the drug development process. And I was wondering, actually, some ideas from anyone on the panel if that would actually be a benefit for consumers. Um, some one topic that we kind of d discussed briefly, <laughs> but um, is on the table with uh, in the TTIP, is actually collaborating on generics and biosimilars. And I was wondering if anyone had any thoughts about if that would be, be beneficial. Um, also from the American side, because apparently it's the FDA that's more reluctant to, to collaborate, particularly on, bi on biosimilars. What do you mean by collaborate? 
um, but work together either on market authorization or on, um, and then I, I mean, David, you, you did bring up some uh, some ideas about asking for transatlantic p patent pool or asking for a transatlantic prize fund. But should we ac actually be putting these proposals on the table? Because um, in theory, it's if if industry can have a, a wish list, or I don't see why a consumer organization should. Dreaming is free. Yeah, dreaming is free exactly. And then the, just. Quickly, um, it, it kind of came up yesterday in the debates, but I was wondering if any of the panelists had some good arguments for why these provisions shouldn't be included. If you ask someone from the pharmaceutical industry, or imagine even the, the trade representatives, they would either say it's necessary to reward innovation, um, the drug development cost process is very expensive, so um, collaborating together would, would, would bring down costs. And um, the, my favorite argument is it's necessary to improve transparency. And from speaking with American consumer organizations, I hear the, their, the arguments are being made, EU countries aren't very transparent. And we hear the same thing, that uh, it's the EU pharmaceutical industry that doesn't view the US system as, as very transparent. So I'd be interesting, interested to hear your thoughts on that. Thank you. And you, you made sure that we can use the last 15 minutes of this session very fruitfully. Very good, very good questions and um, also one very much in support of the earlier uh, proposal to actually have a two-day meeting with the, uh, with the representatives and with the negotiators on what a consumer or more public interest oriented um, agreement would, uh, w would look like. But it didn't look like this was actually going to going to happen when talking to people uh, er earlier this week. So can I ask the panelists, and I'll Joe, start with... Maybe Joe. <coughs> oh, sorry, Joe. I just wanted uh, to answer a couple of Leonardo's questions. So first, I mean, if you read the history, the International Conference on Harmonization, which is the regulators in the industry from Japan, the EU, and the US, um, if you read the history of that, from one of the objectives was that regular, regulatory harmonization would decrease drug costs and benefit consumers. There's no evidence that that ever happened. And the second is that um, there's some pretty good evidence that speeding up the um, regulatory review process um, when you submit a, um, a file to either the EMA or the FDA, that if it's that speeding that up leads to greater um, post-market safety problems once the drugs are on the market. So there really isn't, on these points, any evidence that consumers, patients benefit. Um, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where it's at, my friend. <laughs> it's probably... Right, so put it up louder. <laughs> It's a very, it's a very sad song, actually. It's a fat one. Sorry. <laughs> That's our score. <laughs> this does not mean the meeting is over. The panelists will get a chance Sorry. to respond. Thank you very much, and um, uh, also to to Leo's question, the speeding up of the. Um, I was cringing when I heard the trade negotiator argue that this would be such a benefit for public health, when we all know that rushing new drugs to the market is actually. Uh, creating huge problems because you do it at a moment when you know very little about the drug and what health professionals would say and Joel is one one of those and I, I, I'm sure he would agree with me that uh, new drugs should be brought to market with a great deal of, of caution and with a great deal of monitoring because we know very little uh, little about them so further evidence as to the possible negative effects for health when trade negotiators actually set up these kinds of um, these kinds of objectives for, uh, for for public health. So we have a number of questions. I would like the uh, the panelists to, uh, to to respond to. We've heard already a little bit about the experience so far of um, the ICAs, for example, which came with. This is to Elsa's question. What do we know from other trade agreements? And even if uh, some of that collaboration may have led to reduced costs, it isn't passed on to consumer. It may re it may. Uh, lead to um, to higher uh, to higher profits. Um, the um, any of the uh, the panelists who would like to to comment on what can we learn from previous trade agreements and the effects on on, on, on public health and the promises that are made at the onset of such negotiations that may or may not have 
uh, materialized. Just, um, if, if one has a look at some of the trade agreements that the EU has recently negotiated, like with South Korea and Singapore, and also from the US side, um, the agreement with South Korea and Australia, one can see that there are some provisions on pricing and reimbursement um, that are really really a threat to, to public health and to the affordability of medicines. Um, and for instance, some of these provisions and require that um, pricing and reimbursement decisions are based on market-derived prices or that they take into account the value of the patent. And um, we think that this is completely contradictory with the measures that some member states in Europe, like Spain, Greece, Portugal, a number of them, um, are putting in place to um, try to control and contain costs and provide more affordable medicines. And um, you know, ultimately, we have to think that pricing and reimbursement has to be based on taking into account like, the therapeutic added value of the medicine, as well as health needs and budget, co budget constraints of the country and, and affordability. And none of those provisions inserted in the trade agreements can help in any way uh, to, to, to reduce costs and, and to, to provide more affordable medicines to the general public. So I think this is yeah. yeah, I think there's some concrete examples of how trade agreements have driven up prices, for example, in Jordan. I, I remember being at a, a CI conference and having, oh, it, it, and someone came up to me from Jordan and said, look, David, when we were in these trade agreements with the U.S., is the Jordan U.S. Trade I wish we had spoken to you earlier about what we accepted as far as data exclusivity, patent extension, things like that. It was terrible. Then there are other studies that have been done. I don't know if it was in Central America. I don't know which kind. But there are a number of studies done. Uh, do you know those, Peter? Which countries they are? Yeah, well, there have been studies where, where you document, where you could document the impact of these trade agreements on the on the on the higher prices. I'm sorry, I'm not really prepared to give them. I don't know if it was Guatemala. Guatemala, Guatemala was the study. study. There you go. There's there's one of them, and I think there was also a study in Morocco, or some. Yeah, I think Guatemala and Central America, and I think there was one other study in South America. I'm not sure which country. I'm sorry, I, don't, I can't remember right now, but they're easy to find. Thank thank you. Um, to the question of uh, Leo's question about um, the 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 always the, I was going to say failed trip, but it actually isn't. If we if we don't do this, we will not have uh, we will not have more more innovation. We need more patents. We need longer patents. Otherwise, we won't get to new drugs. And maybe Lee, you would like to to comment on that? Yeah, my response to this sort of thing, and we hear it a lot also in. Uh, in respect to the accelerated approval processes that keep popping up in Congress. My response to that is, I'm really not sure that we should be paying companies to do the job. Um, you know, drug companies are here to make safe, effective drugs. I don't know why we need to incentivize them further. And the fact that they're complaining now because their profits have, well, they say their profits are falling and they're not coming up with new products, again, it's not our fault that they spent several years trying to create the same drug over and over again. <laughs> so, I, I have a real problem with, with, with thinking, they have an incentive to innovate, you know, they, the, the, the population is there, if someone comes up with an Alzheimer's drug, there are plenty of people that are going to take that drug. I, I don't see why we need to pay them more to do what they should be doing in the first place. Theoretically, that's why they exist. So that's my response to that. Okay. Peter, would you like to um, add a few words to that and perhaps answer the question on whether collaboration between the EU and the US on biosimilars regulation could create consumer benefits? We're, we're, we're scraping the barrel. We're looking for consumer <laughs> benefits in this, right? <laughs> Everywhere. <laughs> right. I w well, I don't think I was at that particular discussion yesterday, so I'm not sure what the... Uh, what the negotiators address, but it's certainly I mean, the definitions of biosimilars and and the standards under which um, under which such treatments are are approved is highly technical and controversial. And the biopharmaceutical lobby is working <coughs> very hard right now to limit substitutability of biosimilars um, in, in all the U.S. states, and has already cost us some of the promise savings under Obamacare by uh, by. Uh, insisting on certain delays in that regard. So it you know, depends. I mean, with, with all these agreements, you have to ask the question, of, is this the best forum to do it? And if you, it's a closed-door forum where industry has outsized influence and limits our ability to act in Congress and the Parliament, so I'd say that's a pretty bad bet 
um, for most of these issues. You can, you can imagine a few areas where, in theory, you could come up with regulatory efficiencies mm -hmm. that don't actually eliminate safeguards. I'll be very interested to see if, in the end, the US or EU can actually present us with evidence of such and how much will, how much will take that shape versus just a limiting or otherwise negatively affecting our standards. In terms of past trade agreements, I mean, you just look, look at the WTO itself. I mean, prior, prior to WTO and TRIPS, in many countries that, that, uh, that didn't have patents in this space or had very different requirements. And since then, we're, we're looking at the last, the last 20 years of a, a very different global pharmaceutical landscape of much higher prices and, and, and much more uh, monopolies. Um, there are some South American studies, I guess, Peru and Colombia uh, would be some of the relevant ones. That's the, the last little point is just, uh, it was mentioned, it was mentioned <laughs> that uh, the, the whole point in agreement between the US and European Union the whole point is to freeze the congressional state of play. The whole point is to lock in the victories that the pharmaceutical industry has won, get whatever else they can, and and leave things in that in that state. So as soon as they get 12 years monopoly under Obamacare, see if you can get in Europe, see if you can get in the Asia Pacific through the Trans-Pacific Partnership and other trade agreements. But as much as anything, it's make sure that if the U.S. Congress ever changes its mind or changes its composition, or ever get a little more influence here on the Hill, we won't be able to change that rule. And same with drug price negotiation. I mean, the really major objective of um, economic progressive forces and people that care about health in the United States to improve our capacity and, and, and introduce some authority to actually directly negotiate prices with, with companies. And if the companies can get away with it, they'll make sure that they'll, just, you know, they'll wipe that agenda out entirely by creating a trade regime that says it's impossible uh, so that we never even really have the debate. That's, that's why Public Citizens Global Trade Watch was started in the first place, because we were coming up to the Hill and all kinds of uh, priorities we had for our regulatory state start hearing the lobbyists saying, well, that's GATT non-compliant, WTO non-compliant, you can't do it. I mean, that's, that's the point of the regime is to tie Congress, Congress's hands. So for those who are here from member offices, um, I think it deserves some scrutiny. Thank you. Yes. Uh, thank you, Peter. Just on, just, sorry, just on um, biosimilars, I think, Joel, I think about the supplementary patent certificate. In the, for example, in the EU-Canada EU, EU free trade agreement, they're trying to put in this five-year extra period. No, it's only going to be two years. Oh, they've already agreed on two years. Yeah. It's still bad. Two years. It's still bad. But anyway. Yeah. Okay, good. Okay, so on that, on that note, my mic? Yeah, it's, it's mine. Um, I would like to thank all of you for having participated in this panel. I would like to thank the panelists for their presentations and for answering the questions. And I don't know about you, but um, I am left after two and a half days of, of TTIP with the question, why TTIP at all? The subject matter, uh, re regulation, regulation of, 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 of safety standards, regulation of, of medicines is not, are not the kind of issues that belong in a trade, uh, in a trade negotiations, but they should be, uh, the, the, they are the area of, of, of legitimate democratic processes which are clearly undermined by all of what, uh, what, what, is, uh, what is happening. Uh, the secrecy under which all this is happening is absolutely uh, unacceptable and you, you can see it at this session we're trying to answer questions based on on rumors on, on, on crumbs of information that fall off the table here and there but no one not even our democratically elected representatives are able to assess what is actually going on what we do know from precedence is that it will likely have tremendous effects on access to medicine on the cost of medicines and that is simply not acceptable so I would plead with all of you who are in a position to do something Something about this to act. Uh, with that, I thank you all and uh, wish you a very good lunch.